1320, the Yuan dynasty is in trouble. In the last 26 years, the successors of Kublai Khan, the dynasty's founder, have struggled to find balance between the traditional Mongol way of ruling, widely endorsed by the princes of the steppe, and the Confucian philosophy promoted by the Han Chinese elites. As a result, the Yuan dynasty now faces great financial difficulties and is torn by factional struggles. With the passing of the very Confucian Ayur Barvara, Emperor Renzong of Yuan, an occasion for the pro-Mongol faction to reclaim power has come. Will the Yuan dynasty be restored to its glory days? With the Yuan dynasty's throne empty, three Mongol princes eyed the capital city, Khanbalik, or Dadu. The eldest, Khoisle, also known as Khuislen or Kusala, was a nephew of the late Emperor Ayur Barwad, son of his brother and predecessor Khaisan. An anti-Confucian Mongol traditionalist like his father, he had already tried to take the throne in late 1316 through a rebellion against Ayur Barwad in Shanxi province. As the revolt fell apart, he had fled the Yuan dynasty and found refuge in the Chagatai Khanate. For the time being, he would therefore have to wait. Nonetheless, his younger brother, Tov Tomor, also aimed to sit on the throne. However, immediately after Ayur Barvad's death, Tov Tamor was banished to Hainan Island to ensure that the third contender, the Crown Prince Shadbal, could smoothly ascend the throne and succeed his father. Tov Tamor would nonetheless play a pivotal role a few years later. With no more obstacles in his way, the 18-year-old Crown Prince was enthroned on the 19th of April 1320 and would be recorded as Emperor Yingzong of Yuan and Gagen Khan. However, the young and inexperienced new emperor was initially overwhelmed by political intrigue. His grandmother, Grand Empress Dowager Taiji, could easily reassert her power and strengthen her anti-Confucian faction. She promptly reinstated her champion Tomodor, a despotic Mongol official who had sabotaged many of Ayur Barvad's policies, as Grand Chancellor or Prime Minister of the Right the highest executive position after the emperor. Without Ayur Barvad's resistance, Tomdor was now free to place loyal retainers and relatives of his to positions of power, engaging in a brief reign of terror. Many Confucian opponents, until then protected, were executed. Despite the situation, young Emperor Shadbal, tutored by Han Chinese Confucian scholars and artists, such as the painter Ke Jiu Se, was determined to rule independently. Indeed, he did not share his late father's deep filial piety towards Grand Empress Dowager Taiji. Noticing the young man's fierce determination, she reportedly stated, we should not have raised this boy. By the summer of 1320, a few weeks after his accession, Shadbal appointed the 22-year-old Mongol Baiju to the post of Grand Chancellor or Prime Minister of the Left, the second highest executive position after the Emperor, challenging Tomdor. Baiju's family history granted him great credibility, as he was the descendant of Muhali, a great companion of Chinggis Khan and one of his best generals. Baiju was also the grandson of official Antum, a Confucian and appreciated Grand Chancellor of Kublai Khan. He therefore commanded both the Mongol nobility's respect and the Confucian scholars' admiration. Forming a formidable pair, the emperor and his official were able to counter the schemes of Grand Empress Dowager Taiji and Tomdar, who likely were responsible for a failed plot to depose the young emperor only a few months after his accession. For the foreseeable future, Shadbal and Baiju would have to remain vigilant. When Tomdor died of natural causes in October of 1322 and Grand Empress Dowager Targi in November, the opposition faction they led crumbled and Emperor Shadbach and Baiju took full control of the court. The latter was appointed Grand Chancellor or Prime Minister of the Right, taking up Tomdor's vacant post. It was time for them to launch the Zhizhi reform. Shadbach's policy would largely be the continuation of his father's. As such, 
Many Han Chinese Confucian scholars were immediately integrated in the government to work on the endeavor, and rules ordering high-ranking officials to report malicious activity within the administration were enforced. The emperor implemented nationwide policies easing small landowners' conditions. The great legal compilation of the Yuan dynasty, ordered by his father, was revised and formally promulgated on the 26th of March 1323. To ease the desperate financial situation, the administration was greatly trimmed of many redundant or ineffectual posts. The emperor also cancelled twice the annual grants to the Mongol princes, brewing discontent. Nonetheless, Yang Shadbad enjoyed quite a lavish lifestyle himself. As a devout Buddhist, Shadbad ordered the construction of large Buddhist temples in every prefecture. Impeding on religious tolerance, the mosque in Shangdu was knocked down and replaced by a Buddhist temple. Muslims were further required to pay the household tax from which they were previously exempted, improving the state's finances. Overall, the Yuan dynasty was seemingly recovering under the ambitious emperor's rule. However, Shadbal's ideas and ambitions were not shared by all. In mid-1323, after spending the traditional summer stay in Shangdu, an imperial custom of the dynasty, the emperor made his way back to Hanbalik. On the 4th of September 1323, as the imperial procession camped for the night in an area known as Nanpo, the unthinkable happened. Out of nowhere, the powerful Asud Imperial Guard stormed the camp and assassinated both Grand Chancellor Baiju and the Emperor himself. This event, known as the Nanpo Coup, was orchestrated by the Guard's commander, Tugsh, a former protege of Tomdor and fervent defensor of Mongol tradition. He had been assisted by several conspiring figures and a large part Mongol princes. Losing no time, they rushed to Khanbalik to seize control of the remaining government. The rebels intended to bring back the Yuan dynasty to its roots and restore the Mongol ways. It had been convened that a specific Mongol noble was to inherit its throne. Messengers were immediately dispatched to Mongolia to invite Yosun Tomor, the 31-year-old Jonon, or Prince of Jin, to come to the capital. Yosun Tomor was a child of the steppe who likely could not speak Chinese at all. He was the heir of late Prince Gamala, grandson of Kublai, who had come close to succeeding him in 1294, although surpassed by his brother Tomor. Through his father, Yosun Tomor had inherited the control of great forces and large territories in Mongolia, making him the most influent of the Mongol princes. It is not known if he was involved or even instigator of the coup. In any case, after receiving the imperial seal, Yusun Tomor promptly crowned himself Emperor of the Yuan Dynasty and Great Khan of the Mongol Empire on the 4th of October 1323. The ceremony was carried out in a symbolic place, Khudaralch on the banks of the Khetlian River, the original capital of the Mongol Empire, and the place where Great Khan's Ugede and Mongh had once been crowned. He would have no temple name, being recorded as Emperor Tai Ding, his regnal era name. One month after he had firmly taken control of the dynasty's reigns, Yusun Tomor exiled, purged and executed the officials involved in the coup in a violent purge, perhaps covering his tracks or ensuring they would not turn against him. The emperor then formed a new government composed of Mongol retainers from the steppe and a few Muslim Sumu officials. To consolidate the support of the Mongol nobility, he restored the lavish annual grants to the princes and amnestied some who had been convicted under the previous reigns. Nonetheless, Hussein Tomor knew he could not completely ostracize the Confucian elites, nor completely revert the dynasty to Mongolian culture. To gather their support, the emperor posthumously pardoned and restored the reputation of many Chinese officials that had been purged on the Tomdar's brutal reign of terror. He further showed his goodwill to the Confucian officials by ordering sacrifices to be made at Chu Fu, the birthplace of Confucius, in the philosopher's honor. In addition, 
he refused suggestions to ban the imperial civil service examinations. Finally, the Mongol ruler regularly listened to Confucian scholars' lectures through translators, likely to better understand the Chinese ideology and way of ruling. Hyosun Tomor, like his predecessors, was a devout Buddhist who patroned the construction of many temples. Konga Lotro Gyaltsen, the imperial preceptor, a paramount spiritual and political figure created by Kublai Khan, who advised the UN emperors on all Tibetan affairs, was instructed by Yosun Tomor to conduct the Tibetan initiation ceremony for him and several members of the imperial family several times within the imperial palace. The emperor further gifted many Buddhist lamas with jade and gold seals, granting them great privileges throughout the empire. In time, complaints against these lamas were made more and more. Indeed, with the constant favours and protection of the imperial court, many of them had gradually turned bold and arrogant. They reportedly wreaked havoc in the Yuan provinces. In the worst cases, some were accused of expropriating people from their houses and even raping their wives. In a rather timid response, Yosun Tomor ordered the lamas to be confined to Tibet and Mongolia preventing them from entering China proper without official permission. The emperor did seem to care about the well-being of the people and the state, and took his role of Great Khan of the Mongol Empire very seriously. Yosun Tomor made efforts to rekindle relations with the other Khanates of the fragmented Mongol Empire through gifts and embassies. This was rather effective, as tributes were soon received from the Chagatai leaders, the Il Khan of Persia, and even Uzbek Khan of the Golden Horde, the most defiant of the Khanates, who sent a tribute including cheetahs to the Yuan court in 1326. The emperor also warmed relations with the banished sons of Haisan, Tov Tomor, confined to Hainan Island, and Hoysle, or Ruslen, exiled in the Chagatai Khanate. The former was recalled to the capital in 1324, and the latter sent tribute to the emperor in 1327. Interestingly, during his reign, Usum Tomor would receive the visit of the Franciscan missionary and adventurer Odric of Pordenone, who arrived at Hanbalik in 1324, after a long journey from Italy. The friar had made his way across Asia through the Ilkhanate, India, and had arrived in southern China, from which he joined the capital. At the time, Hanbalik hosted three Franciscan missions, which had been founded by Giovanni of Montecorvino. This Catholic diplomat and adventurer had been sent to Kublai's court as a diplomatic envoy and papal legate by Pope Nicholas IV in 1289. After arriving at the UN court, he had received support from Emperor Tomor and founded his first Catholic church in 1299. Across the years, he had converted thousands of Chinese, Mongols and Uyghurs to Catholicism and was consecrated Archbishop of Hanbalik in 1308. By 1324, when Odric of Pordenone arrived, Giovanni was an elderly man reaching 80 years of age. Odric certainly remained in one of the three missions founded by him and likely exchanged with him frequently. He however also met Yoson Tomor as he was invited to the emperor's personal quarters where he described the etiquette of the UN imperial court. Despite relative external tranquility, Yosun Tomor's reign was not a calm and stable one. During his time on the throne, the UN dynasty began suffering many natural disasters which would contribute to its demise. In northern Mongolia, the weather became increasingly harsher and colder. The winter of 1323 was a particularly devastating one, as the region was afflicted with bitter cold and snowstorms, leading to the death of most cattle, the livelihood of the Mongols. Subsequently, famine arose and huge numbers sought refuge south. The migration became so problematic that the emperor had no choice but to spend great sums in relief programs and eventually forbade the Mongols from migrating without express permission. In the south, the weather alternated between severe droughts and floods, which destroyed the crops and led to famine as well, forcing the court to allocate much of its finances in relief. Finally, earthquakes shook the nation regularly, 
with five major ones reportedly occurring in the year 1327. With such disasters, many Han Chinese began to think the Yuan dynasty had lost the mandate of heaven, a dynasty's divine right to rule in the Chinese mentality, which the founder Kublai had claimed only five decades ago. Inevitably, unrest grew and many small riots erupted in southern provinces, although these troubles were easily put to an end by the Yuan forces. However, more serious revolts were brewing. Many would be inspired by spiritual beliefs such as the White Lotus sect. This social movement was embedded in a syncretic belief of Buddhism and Manichaeism that prophesied that Bodhisattva Maitreya, a successor to the Buddha Gautama, was to come when the world was suffering and in need of aid to establish a new age of Buddhism. In the face of the declining situation of the Yuan dynasty, Many in the White Lotus subsequently claimed Maitreya would return at any time to help the followers. As the sect had become more and more radical and violent, it was officially banned by the Yuan court in 1308, but continued as a secret society that grew more and more discontent with the Mongol authorities. In June 1325, a local leader of the sect named Zhao Chaosi managed to rally hundreds of followers and angered men in Xizhou, modern-day Xi County in Henan province. Agitating the crowds, Zhao Chaosi shouted, Mi lo fu dang yao tian xia. Maitreya rules over all, and encouraged everyone to take up arms against the Yuan dynasty. This revolt is regarded as the first of the dynasty's decline. Nonetheless, its impact on the Yuan was small, as the rebels were promptly crushed and their leaders executed. Although Yusun Tomor seemed to genuinely care about the well-being of the empire, he was unable to face the challenges of the times and would leave the dynasty in this tenuous state. Indeed, on the 15th of August 1328, the emperor died of illness at 34 years old in Shangdu. His passing would lead to the most violent succession crisis of the dynasty. Four years before his death, Yusun Tomor had designated his young son Ergiwag as the crown prince. Subsequently, the loyalist faction, headed by the late emperor's grand chancellor of the right, Daulat Shah, and princes close to Yusun Tomor, organized the eight-year-old prince's enthronement, which was to take place on the 3rd of October 1328 in Shangdu. As the preparations for the child emperor's coronation were made, one could think that the Yuan dynasty would peacefully go on under the regency of loyalist officials. However, history would not see it this way. A new figure would emerge. Back in Hanbalik, an obscure military commander had ambitions of his own. This man was Iltomor, an official of Kipchak origin. Iltomor, also known as Yentomor, had quite a prestigious background his clan had loyally fought alongside Kublai during the rebellion of Prince Nayan and during the border conflicts against the Chagatai Khanate. Alongside his own father, the commander had been a close retainer of anti-Confucian Emperor Haisan back in the Mongolian steppe. However, after the Confucian Ayur Barvad took power, Iltilmur's family had lost most of its fortune and favour in court. Nonetheless, he held a prominent position within the Bureau of Military Affairs, or Privy Council, in charge of the dynasty's whole military. As such, he had been entrusted with the command of the Imperial Guard in Hanbalik when late Yusun Tomor left the capital for Shangdu. It is likely that Iltomor planned to restore his family's glory and developed a cunning scheme to take power back. Now that the Emperor was dead, it was the time to act. Only three weeks after the death of Yusun Tomor, El Tomor stormed the palace using the powerful Imperial Guard and the support of some high-ranking officials in the early hours of the 8th of September 1328, successfully taking control of the government. Khan Balik was firmly in El Tomor's hands. However, this was only half of his developed scheme. Indeed, his allies in Shangdu were to take action simultaneously and seize control of the secondary capital as well. The conspirators were however discovered by loyalist commanders and executed. Subsequently, the two historical capitals of the Yuan dynasty, Khanbalik and Shangdu, 
had fallen into the hands of two opposing factions, Il Timurs and the Loyalists. Inevitably, the War of the Two Capitals began. While the Loyalists, supporting the soon-to-be-enthroned Prince Ergibag, assembled their forces to counteract, Ilthimur and his faction prepared the coronation of their own emperor in Khan Balik. The Kipchak commander's plan was clear. He would restore Khaisan's lineage to the throne, and therefore his own family glory. The legitimacy of Khaisan's sons came from a supposed promise between himself and his brother and successor Ayur Barvar, according to which the throne would pass on to Khaisan's sons after Ayur Barvar, since the latter designated instead his own son, Shadbaid, as the crown prince. Il Timur claimed that Khaisan's sons were the rightful heirs to the throne, and that anyone else was illegitimate. This supposed agreement, however, seems to be a fabrication. In any case, Il Timur knew he had to act fast. Since Khaisan's eldest son, Khoshila, also known as Khuslen or Kosala, was still in exile in the Chagatai Khanate. Il Timur turned his attention to a younger son, Tov Tomor. As a reminder, Tov Tomor was a Mongol prince who had been banished to Hainan Island upon Shadbad's enthronement. During the subsequent reign of Yosun Tomor, he was recalled to the mainland and settled in Jiankang, modern day Nanjing. He was then granted the title of Prince of Huai and moved to Jiangling, modern day Jingzhou. Now was the occasion to escort him to Khan Balik to assume the imperial leadership of the dynasty. For this task, Il Timur dispatched his most loyal and capable general, Boyan of the Merkid tribe, to bring back the Mongol prince to the capital. Meanwhile, the loyalists in Shangdu were ready. The child prince Ergibag was crowned on the 3rd of October 1328. He would have no temple name, being recorded as Emperor Tian Shun after his regnal era name. Two weeks later, Tov Tomor was enthroned in turn in Hanbali on the 16th of October and would be recorded as Emperor Wanzong of Yuan and Jayatu Khan. Thus, the Yuan dynasty had two emperors. With both sides supporting their figurehead as the only legitimate leader of the nation, war engulfed the Yuan dynasty. The loyalist faction moved first, marching its forces south to retake Hanbalik. The confident loyalist soldiers breached the Great Wall at several points, reportedly even reaching the northern outskirts of Hanbalik. Unfazed, Il Timur marched his own forces out of the city to meet his enemy in battle, and personally led his soldiers as a seasoned general. As battle broke out, the talented Kipchak commander had no trouble defending Hanbalik. Before long, the loyalists found themselves in a losing position. Keeping them engaged in the turmoil, Il Timur saw the opportunity of attacking Shangdu, stripped of its army, and sent word to his allies in Mongolia and Manchuria. Subsequently, they launched a surprise pincer attack from the east and west on the secondary capital on the 14th of November. Unable to resist the siege, the city surrendered the very next day, and the loyalist leaders were executed. During these events, child Emperor Ergibag disappeared in suspicious circumstances, possibly sacrificed by the loyalists to prevent his capture, or executed by the victorious army. Although Shangdu had fallen, several loyalist strongholds would continue to fight the restoration in Shanxi, Sichuan, and Yunnan provinces. The pacification of the nation would take years, plunging the Yuan dynasty in a costly civil war which drained the treasury. Subsequently, discontent and unrest gravely worsened within the Han Chinese population, which now had to suffer from the civil war in addition to the regular natural disasters. Although the government, now controlled by the military commander Il Tomor, using Tov Tomor as a puppet emperor, was still in control of the nation, the Yuan dynasty had inevitably entered its decline. The man who would overthrow it was just born. Thank you for watching my video, I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions or requests, feel free to leave them in the comment section below.